It's a privilege to be here tonight in the service of the Lord, but it's certainly a sad thing that the people can't have a place to sit down after we have invited you to come and then no place to sit down. And as I come up just now, while there were people around the windows and up and down on the streets and so forth, and it's not a, not even a place for them to be, get into the building, but it's just a little bitty church. and We never advertise it, and even in the paper here, we just, uh, or some of our friends calling up on the telephone and talking about coming to be prayed for, and we told them just to come on, so... Uh, the news just gradually gets started around. Somebody come over from Louisville and then tell somebody else and somebody, you know, that's how it gets around. I wanted to get the high school uh, down here, but they, I couldn't get it on account of school being in. And uh, Then we would have uh, advertised it. want the people, local people to know that we wasn't trying to push you away from it, but we just knew the room was very bad. So... We, uh, if we could have got to high school, we would have, have done so, but we couldn't. So now, t- tonight will be the last night for the books in the back that Mr. Mercer and them has here and the tapes and so forth. And then tomorrow morning is Sunday school. And immediately after the Sunday school takes her place, the Lord willing, I want to speak on evangelistic s- sermon uh, tomorrow morning. That will begin at 9.30, I think, is it, Brother Neville? At 9.30, the Sunday school starts. And um, immediately after Sunday school classes, we want to speak the subject of, a, of an evangelistic message, a call to the sinner. And these nights we've been mostly given since last Sunday night to the sick and the needy, the, the afflicted. And um, then tomorrow night, we are going to try to, if we possibly can in any way, to take up all the prayer cards that's been given out. And everyone that has come and got the prayer cards, we, after the message is over, if we have to let some back away and then bring the others up so we can get the prayer line going, we'll be glad to do it. And the prayer cards for tomorrow night will be given out after Sunday school in the morning. Right after Sunday school will be about perhaps 11.30 that the, the um, prayer cards will be given out tomorrow. So you who have your loved ones and so forth that's coming to be prayed for, why have them here about at least 11.30 if they can't be in for the morning message. That is, if you have a, a place of worship that you've been going, well, we'd, we wouldn't pull you away from there at all. We would just want you to feel just real free about what you were going to do. I've been awfully busy today, and just a few moments ago, they come and said, well, if you go on down, you start preaching. Right now, it was already a little tabernacle was filled up. So I just thought on a few verses I thought I would speak on tonight and want to thank the Lord first for all that He has done for us those reports coming back from those that's been prayed for and spent in the meeting. Great things has taken place just for this little place here. And no more than it's got to be come up and be personally prayed for, but it's seemingly that the people back in the audience are getting better than they are up here on the platform. So we're glad for that. That's very fine to see them get it like that. Now tonight... I have chosen for a text, Faith is Our Victory. And I wish to read a portion of the scripture found in 1 John, the 5th chapter and the 4th verse. (coughs) For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now, such wonderful words. Our faith is the victory. And now, speaking on victory, there has been many great victories won in this long stretch of years that humanity has been on the earth. 
I was reading the book on the surrender of, of Paris that where in this last uh, the second world war that when Hitler had been brought into Paris at the Ark of Triumph they say that it was such a victory until it taken hours for those German soldiers marching the goose step right through the Ark of Triumph while Hitler stood at attention and the whole air was black above, the skies were shut off from airplanes moving over. Such a time of victory that after they had won the war over France and France had surrendered to Germany. And then in London, England, I had the privilege once of seeing there at the conference a movie picture of where that the, had been taken by the Russians that when Berlin surrendered to Russia and how that, that great mammoth mass of military equipment those great cannons that they had on the mounted onto these great tanks that could revolve around just moved into Berlin you could hardly see how any life could even exist for mile after mile and everyone shooting just on precision shots to where they just come up like a great swarm of locusts and they just simply battered Berlin to the ground. And when then they pulled off their tanks and the, the infantry went in and mopped up, they sent and got Mr. Stalling. And when they flew him in by the plane and it landed, all those Russian soldiers went down the street as a twist and a step as they make it as a victor, the Russian victor sign. And how Stalin stood at attention while tens of thousands of soldiers marched through the streets of Berlin when it laid in ashes. And when the German women had been ravished in the streets and the little killed and some of them burned and so forth, but that was quite a victory for Russia. Then I am told that Napoleon, the great victor of a day gone by, some years ago, about five years, I had the privilege of stopping near Waterloo. And I was picked a little book up there and I was reading the life of Napoleon. He hated the French. He come over into France, born down on an island, and come to France to get even with them, but become a great conqueror. He was a gentleman to start with. But success went to his head. And it's said that women, when they were going to put their little babies to bed, that he was so feared he put everything to death that didn't agree with him. That the women, instead of saying the old booger man's going to get you, they would say Napoleon's going to get you. And the little bright-eyed fellows would get their heads under the cover real quick, thinking of that great monster Napoleon. But you see, the victory that he won didn't last. He was an prohibitionist to start with and died at the age of 33, an alcoholic. Victory of that type don't last because it's not wrought right. You can never get good out of wrong. You've got to play the rule of the game fair. 
And any one of you know that in Olympics or any other athletical exercises, no matter if you arrive first in the race, but if you haven't played the game according to the rules, you're disqualified. You have to play the rule right. And that's the way it is with human life. You can't play the rules of the game of life wrong and expect to win. You've got to play it according to God's Word and the purpose that you were brought here for. Now, there is so many people that doesn't seem to have any kind of a purpose in life. Especially in this day that we now live. People just seem to think that all they have to do is to keep up with somebody else. With the fashions of the world. And with the enticements that the world has given to them. Just like this. If you go to school and some of the little girls wear a certain little frock or dress or whatever you would call it. All the ambition the rest of the school has is the pattern after that girl. Some of the women see on the television some certain lady come out and dressed in a certain fashion. Well, that's their ambition is to dress and to act like that. And that seems to be just about the limit of the American ambition. Is to get a new job or to get a raise in your salary and to get a television or a new car. Let me say this. Those things may be all right, but there's higher ambitions in the human life than those things. And Christians should set their affection on higher ambition. Hallelujah. Help us, Lord. I think it would pay us all to sit down and wonder why we are here in the first place. Praise God. And ever who was kind enough to bring us here, we ought to consider and ask Him what He would have us to do the purpose of us coming to fulfill what He has purposed for us. But we seem to be just wanting to keep up with the world. Now the Bible said that we can overcome the world. And how do we do it? Not by keeping up with the fashions of the world, but the Bible said that faith is the victory Amen. that overcomes the world. Praise God. It reminds me of one time that uh, I don't like to say this word, but it was just a bum that came to the door. And he said, could you give me a, a sandwich? I said, certainly would you step in? And instead of making him a sandwich, I thought I'd fix him something to eat. And fixed him up just about what I could around the place and set him down to eat. And while he was eating, I thought I would speak to him, seeing that he was a, a traveler. And I said, where did you come from? He just shoved his shoulders a little and said, Nowhere. I said, Then where are you going? And he stopped eating and looked up at me and said, Nowhere. <laughs> he looked around and swallowed a big bite and he said, Sir, just where my hat's resting, there's where I rest. I said, I see. I said, how long have you been doing this? He said, oh, some 20 years or more. 
with no ambitions to, to better himself. Now, that's just about the attitude of the people. Just what I call drifters, floaters. And the people who join the church is just about the same. I've often thought of floating, driftwood. A driftwood, it just hangs up in any kind of trash. That's just about the way that floaters does in the church or anywhere. Now you take on a stream like the stream of life and plenty of driftwood hanging up in every trash pile and yet the boat comes along made out of wood too. But if you notice the wood is made and shaped out by a master. Who has built the boat? Not only is it shaped out, but it is guided by a master. And it is pushed by a power. And we're all made out of the same stuff. It just depends on how your ambitions run. Are you willing to let the master craftsman make out of you? That which he could use. And that which he could control. And that which he could power. If this certain little craft that's been made different and been crafted out by the master's hand should ever stick into some weeds along in shallow waters. There is a power behind it, a little boat that the master can turn on and push it out into the deep waters again. God wants to mold and make us what He wants us to be. But how can we do that, or how can God do that, when we won't even stand still for Him to do it? We want to be our own master. We want to think our own way of thinking. And many people come into the church and join the church and put their name on the book and doesn't even consider what that church believes. Or check up with that church how they preach the Word of God. Or whether they stand for the full gospel or not. Or just pick out a potion and add a creed. Floating. Drifting. Never be able to mount to anything. But let me tell you something tonight. You on the in and outside of this building. You're going to wind up at a destination one of these days. That's going to be in the valley of the shadows of death. I would advise you at this hour to prepare to meet the God that will have to meet you at that hour. You'll either meet Him as a masterpiece that He has worked on or a floating piece of driftwood to go into your final destination. So don't you use this life just to drift around and float around and and get a better job and to dress better and to get a new television or or a better car. Life means more than that. Don't you try to use it just to say, well, if the rest of them join church, I will too. When you join church, you should first seek out and find out what that church stands for. Is it just merely a place that the people go together for fellowship? Or is it a place that preaches the word of the living God and stands for every principle that Jesus died for? You should do that. Just don't float in and go with the tide because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth to life. And but few there will be that will go in thereat. 
Because broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many will there be go in. We've got to have a purpose of something. Now, it wasn't so in days gone by or in this day that when a man come to God, he had a purpose of doing it. If your purpose is just to drift at that congregation, or is it to look up toward God? Daniel, when he was taken down into Babylon, Though he was going away from his home. And he was going to have to be a slave to another nation of people. But Daniel purposed in his heart. No matter what they did to him. He wasn't going to defile himself with the Babylonian sin. Oh, if we had more gallant men like that, that would purpose in your heart. If I am a Christian, I'm going to find out every divine blessing that belongs to me and claim it. If the Bible teaches that I can receive the Holy Spirit, I'm going to stay on my knees till God gives me the Holy Spirit. And just not drift. I was reading old Uncle Buddy Robinson's life story some time ago. And he was such a great man. And a, a loving man. And a man of faith. And he got the hunger for the Holy Spirit because the Bible taught it. And it says that one day he was plying corn and he stopped his old mule, Elec, got down in the corn row and said, God, if you don't give me the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when you come back to earth, you'll find my bones laying right here. That's purposing in your heart. That's really getting to business. When you get that kind of an Purpose in your heart, God's going to open the windows of heaven. Something has to take place. You've got to get to business with God. And have some purpose and some gratitude for Him saving you. And when Daniel had purpose in his heart and the devil made him prove it, But we find out that it stood good in the face of a hungry lion. And a man that ever comes to God and really down in his heart finds a settled faith. It'll stand good in the mouth of death or in the mouth of sickness, in the mouth of sorrow. It'll stand good. For faith is the victory. You have overcome by your faith. Abraham, just a man with no certain purpose in life, just with his father and his friends coming down from Babylon, they settled in the Shanghai and there they had a, the tower built and so forth and they One day while Abraham was praying, no doubt, he prayed through till he struck the hand of God. How did he do it? By faith. Perhaps he thought like this. If there is a God who made the ark and let Noah float through, he still lives today. Somewhere in the land of heathens where he was a a sojourning, he touched the hand of God. And in there God gave him a revelation that there was a city whose builder and maker was God. And 
we read that all Abraham's life, he was a pilgrim and a stranger Amen. to the world, for his one ambition was to find that city Amen. whose builder and maker was God. Amen. He struck something. He caught God and a faith in that God that he foresaw the new Jerusalem. And he put his pack on his back and became a wanderer. Not just floating about without any purpose. He had faith that there was a city whose builder and maker was God. An eternal city. He had a purpose in life to find that place. May I say here that one day when the battle was over, he met the king of that city. Amen. And he gave him the communion. Hallelujah. Bread and wine, Melchizedek. Praise God. Oh, you can't purpose anything of God's promise in your heart without finding the reality to it. Amen. Hallelujah. If your soul has been tormented by sins and doubts and ups and downs and frustrations, Hallelujah. and there's something down in you that's telling you that there's somewhere you can overcome that, why do you float around then from church to church and from place to place? Just kneel down till you strike heaven. Amen. And as I said last night, go beyond the sound barriers. Amen. Then you'll have a purpose in life. You'll have a purpose in belonging to the church. You'll have a purpose in being baptized. You'll have a purpose in what you're seeking for. Because we know that God is honest and God is true and God cannot lie. And if God placed that into Abraham's heart by His voice, His Word, then God has placed in before us in His Bible and by the witness of the Holy Spirit, by the returning of the Holy Spirit in signs and wonders, that Jesus Christ still lives and is the same yesterday, today, and Amen. forever. Amen. Yes, hallelujah. Then why would we seek any longer after those things that we desire? If you need any need whatsoever that God has promised in His Bible, He's shared tonight to meet Amen. that need. Amen. Praise the Lord. No need seeking farther. His presence is here. His Spirit is here. Amen. And He's willing and ready and longing Amen. to give to you that what you are so seeking for. Hallelujah. Why would you wait any longer? When you come to Him, don't come as a floater. I'll go up and try it and see if it works. Oh, amen. Oh. You'll never get nowhere. But when you come with this kind of a determination Amen. that you have sold out lock, stock, Amen. and barrel. Amen. Hallelujah. When you're tired of the world and sin and unbelief and frustrations Amen. and doubts yeah. and come to the living God with an anchor surely Amen. tightened in the rock of ages. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit shared to Pull you into the presence of the living God. Amen. That will give you a faith that will overcome anything there Amen. is in the world. Amen. Sickness, disease, and even death itself. Oh, Hallelujah. You say, you said death, Brother Branham. Yes. And that's what I meant. Amen. Amen. Death was not at Lazarus who was laying dead in the ground and had already corruption set in when Jesus said to Martha, Where have you buried him? 
And if you won't doubt, you shall see the glory of God. Amen. Did not I tell you not to doubt, he said to Jairus that night or that day? If you only believe you can see the glory of God, then faith overcomes death. Faith is a victory over death. Faith is the victory over sin. Faith is the victory over sickness. Faith is the victory over weary. Faith is the victory over frustrations. Faith is the victory over the world. You say, John, when he wrote that, he did not have my troubles. He did not have to deal with the folk that I deal with. He did not have to go through the things that I do. That's right. He may not have had to deal with the same folk. He may not have had to overcome the same thing. But he never excluded them. Amen. For he said, "This the faith is the victory that overcomes the world, Amen. the whole thing. Amen. How is it? Get faith in it. Amen. Right above it. When we have the written Word of God laying before us and the Holy Spirit here performing and showing the resurrection of the Lord Jesus with the divine promises written here that whatsoever thing you desire when you pray, believe you receive it and you shall have it. What do you have to do then? Have faith. Not just floating faith. Not just a make-believe faith. But a real faith. Now, faith is a conqueror. Faith is an overcomer. It just isn't a a peacemaker. It overcomes. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. What does it do? What is faith? What is the conquer? Conquer and victory is the same. To conquer, it means to beat down, to override, to handcuff, to throw into prison. It means that the sin that once ruled you, you rule it now. It means that you have overcome it. You are, you've whipped it. You're greater than it is. Oh, I feel religious right now. Which was first, a sinner or a Savior? A Savior. For a Savior is more powerful than a sin. Which was first a healer or a sickness? It couldn't be a healer unless it was over the sickness. It is a healer. It can conquer the sickness. And faith is the victory that overcomes every curse of the devil. Amen. Faith Hallelujah. is the victory. Faith in what? Praise God. Not faith in your church. No. Not faith in your creed. No. Not faith in some man. No. But faith in Jesus Christ who Amen. made the promise. That's the victory. What is it? Amen. It is the victory. Amen. Say my arm's still crippled, but faith is the victory. Hallelujah. I still feel sick, but faith is a victory. Amen. Oh, it overcomes the world. Yes. When you can climb into God by prayer until you see the thing conquered under you. Amen. There is nothing that can hurt you then. You've overcome. You've got 50 miles of elbow room. Amen. You're sailing free then. Amen. You who've been a drunkard and a slave to whiskey, you'll be the master over him then. Amen. That old devil of alcohol that made you drink, he's your master now. Amen. But when you get faith, I don't mean make belief, real faith, he's your servant then. Praise God. You who can't lay down tobacco, you women and men. When it comes to a place to where you can get to that spot to where you have overcome it by faith, you'll master it then. Amen. A little woman is sitting present now. 
She has been at this altar time after time after time. A good woman. But she started smoking a long time ago. And she just couldn't overcome it. And she'd come up and I would pray with her. And it seemed like she just couldn't overcome it. And uh, the first thing you know, I, I told her here, I said, there will be danger down the road. She said, oh, Brother Branham, I have cried, I have begged. You see, just the emotional fight in the air. That won't do any good. And I'd get down and pray with her and lay hands on her. And she'd go back and, and a few days I'd meet her again. Just knock you down with cigarette smoke. Hands still brown. And one night down under she went to a doctor. Began to get sick and wither away to just a little spindly thing. And the doctor looked into her and he said, Cancer. Smoking cigarettes. There she was laying there to die. Then she got down to business. See, a drowned man will reach for a straw. As long as you can walk out of this church tonight, know you can go join the Methodist or Baptist. As long as you can sit in here and say, Now, I'll just, I'm a good person. There's nothing wrong with me. You can't do nothing with you. That's right. But when you see your sins as God sees them in the light of His Bible, when you see you'll repent or perish, something will take place. You get the business. Walk out of here in a smothering around your heart. The doctor back there will maybe raise up and come up and look says a heart attack. You get the business. Amen. That's when she had to get the business. And the woman sitting looking at me now. I'm Brother Roberson's back there and Mr. Woods here, Brother Woods sitting here somewhere. And I were going down hunting, I believe, somewhere in the truck. And the Holy Spirit seemed to move us to go way up through the knobs to where she was. And when I got there, she had had a dream. And when the Holy Spirit came into the room and she got down to real business, she never smoked a cigarette from then on and she's gained many pounds of weight and they can't find a trace of the cancer. What is it? It's faith that overcomes. Amen. Why didn't it overcome when I was praying for her here? She's just fluttering around. But when the doctor says you got cancer and going to die, she got the business. That's the way it has to get. When you get to business, why wait that long? Why not get down to business now? Yeah, Put your faith in God. What if the woman had her faith in me? It had failed. Because I'm a man. But when she changed her faith, not in the Branham Tabernacle, or in William Branham, or in anyone else, yeah, but man. placed her faith in Jesus Christ, then she got faith. She raised up above all the fears and doubts. Amen. And God healed her. And oh, she overcome. Faith is the victory that overcomes. I've often wondered what does Christians want to frustrate themselves with them things anyhow. Men and women comes to me many times and says in their confessions and so forth, when I have those private interviews and they, we meet them who make confessions of living immoral and all kinds because they can't deny it. The Holy Spirit's right there. If they try to cover it up, it brings it right out for them. So they might as well tell it. If they try to get up, Holy Spirit stops them and says, just a minute, here's a certain, certain thing. So when they come, they begin to tell me about the little things of the world and I notice it amongst of believers you're going somewhere. What you drifting for? Get some ambition about you. Set your goal on Christ. Amen. And quit tallying with the world. You'll pick up a magazine. You'll say, Now the divine healers of this day. 
There is no such as divine healers. That'll put a doubt in your mind. Somebody get on the radio and say, Oh, preach a pretty good sermon, but say, The days of miracles is past. You'll support it. See, that weakens you. Shout! Get right with God. Either be what you are or don't be at all. God's Bible doesn't teach it, then get away from it. If it does teach it, stay with it. It reminds me of this. For instance, what if we were going to take a little trip in 30 days from now to another land? And in this land, the climate was so wonderful that we had never come back no more. And over there, we would never have to die or get old. But we would just be there forever. Could I imagine seeing you going around to the 10 cent store buying up a lot of junk to take with you? You'd be trying to get rid of what junk you had. And when you just Flusterate yourself with joining one church and then the other. You accumulate more junk. But if you think of where you're going, you'll get rid of a lot of that doubt and nonsense. You'll have real faith. I say to people, are you, Brother Bram, and praise the sick? Yeah. Well, that's against my faith. Then you haven't got any faith. The Bible teaches it. And now uh, many people come into the line and they say, Oh, I got all faith in what you're doing up here. <laughs> oh, it isn't so. Real faith knows no defeat. Amen. It cannot be defeated. Even death itself Amen. can't defeat it. Amen. It knows no defeat. Trials no defeat. But faith knows no defeat. It cannot be defeated. And it is the only way that you can please God. For without faith it is impossible to please God. The Hebrews 11. And in this place, could I imagine you going around, some of you slang using Christians, using smutty, dirty words, and yet belonging to church. Could I imagine you going over to another land and then going around to America learning all the American slang that you know could hear about? Certainly you wouldn't. The thing you'd be trying to do would be learn a few words of that language over there. So right. As much to say, how do you do anyhow? And I think it would, it would behoove Christians more today if they were trying to learn some heavenly language the praises of God that we're going to sing over there and enjoy. And the people that does not believe in shouting, what would you do when you get over there? You'd be so out of place. Better get faith and overcome now for faith is the victory that overcomes. No, you wouldn't be tagging little things like that. You'd be having victory. You say, how do I do it, Brother Brandon? Why, it's so simple. It's just, now at the meeting chair, you wonder how to submit here, how the people in the building. I do not know many. And in my meetings sometime, I know no one, even different languages. But how do I, how do I know it? Is to submit yourself. Just give yourself over to the Holy Spirit. Then it isn't you anymore. You don't know what you're going to say. You just let Him do the same. It's so simple as this. Many of you people have faith in your doctors. And you should have if you've got a doctor. And now when something gets wrong with you, You'll go to that old faithful doctor that you believe in. That's what you should do. That's good. And then you submit your case to him. If he says you should go to the hospital, you don't do a thing but go home and pack up your clothes and take off to the hospital. 
Sure. You got faith in the doctor. If he doesn't decide that you want to go to the hospital, or you should go rather, he'll write out a prescription and he'll give you a sack full of pills. And you'll swallow them. And you don't know what's in those pills. But you've got faith in your doctor. How about God? And you're scared to swallow some of the gospels that He gives you. By His stripes you were healed. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Swallow it and see what happens. It's a confidence. You show what confidence you have in your doctor by taking his medicine that you don't know what it is. You show your confidence in the doctor by submitting yourself to an operation that proves your confidence in the doctor. But when it comes to Christ, you're scared to take Him at His word. How is it? Faith is the victory. If you could submit your case to Jesus Christ tonight, just as you submit your case to the doctor, give me anything you want to, Lord. You're the doctor on the case. Then you've got the victory. Then you've got faith that overcomes. You never hunt another prayer line. You'll never hunt nothing else. You'll have it right there. It'll be all settled. You'll never jump from church to church to see if this one's got it or that one's got it. They haven't got it. You've got it then. When you've got the faith, you have the victory. I'll tell you what we need tonight in America and what we need tonight here in this tabernacle is to let Dr. Jesus come in and perform an operation on our faith. The doctor tells you you got a little appendix. It's all poison. It ought to come out. you got this, that, or the other. Uh, it's wrong. It's got to come out. Well, he takes it out so the rest of it can function right. And what's the matter tonight with our faith? We're afraid to let God take His operating word, His knife, sharper than a two-edged sword, and operate on us and tell us that our little fang dangle humbugging around is wrong and we've got to turn loose ever shatter and sail towards God's eternal promise. Oh, if we'll do that, Jesus will perform an operation upon our faith, taking away all the doubt, all the fears, and all the weary, all the sin, everything there is. And then when our faith is clearly operated on, we come out a new creature. We're a different man. We need an operation. Can you trust Jesus Christ for that operation? Can you believe in Him? Can you say, Lord God, at Thy Word, at Thy Word, as the disciples said in St. Mark 5, when they said, we stained all night and have taken nothing, Nevertheless, Lord, at thy word, I'll let down the net, said Peter. Lord, I am a fisherman. I know the signs when the moon's just right. I know when they're biting and when they're not. I know when they're in their schools and when they're not. Not only that, but I've seen all night. And here is a council of doctors here with me. Dr. Fisherman's. And we know our trade. And we've searched this stream all night long and haven't taken nothing. But at thy word, Lord, I'll let down the net. Because the chief surgeon said so. The chief doctor said so. And they enclosed such a multitude of fishes till their nets begin to break. Why? Faith is the victory. There might not have even been one fish in the water. But when God has made a promise, He'll create fish and put them there. There may not be a chance for you to live. You may be dying with cancer. You may be bound to a wheelchair. You may be totally blind. I don't know what your trouble is. 
But if you'll take the chief doctor's prescription, whatsoever thing you desire when you pray, believe you receive it, and you shall have it and believe that that faith will overcome any difficulty that there is. You may be so burdened with sin until your soul is as smutty as it can be. You may have tried to get rid of that ill temper, that slandering tongue, that gossip on the telephone. You might have tried every remedy you know how. But if you'll just let Jesus Christ come into you tonight, He'll operate on your faith and give you a faith that'll climb beyond anything that the world can produce. Why? Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. How could you doubt? When Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, is present here now. His great Holy Spirit in this building. The Word promised that, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. It was promised by the Lord. God has to keep His Word. Do you believe that? When He promised He'd do these things, God is solemnly obligated to do such. Now, I want you to think it over. If you have sin, if there's anything wrong in your life, I want you to think it over while we bow our heads just a moment for prayer. Before we pray, I'd like to ask this question. I'd like to ask if there is a man, woman, boy, or girl that's in this building that would say by an uplifted hand, Lord, I just seemingly can't overcome. It seems like I know that I shouldn't do these things. I I know I shouldn't do this and that. But I want you to operate on my faith right now after this message. I want you to give me a complete check and over and operate on the ever little disease of my faith that would keep me from overcoming these things. Hold up your hand to Him, will you do it? The Lord bless you. Place just full of hands. Little, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. And run with patience this race that's been set before us. Looking to the author and finisher of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. How many in here that's sick and needy would raise up your hand and say, Lord, operate on my faith. I have need tonight, Lord. God bless you. Faith is the victory. How do we get faith? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Now for you who are needy, so sinful, I cannot make an altar call to have you come up here to the altar as the fashion of the tabernacle is because there's not even room. There are people that are standing around the walls. There are people that are that are uh, over the altar share, and it's just a place where we can't do it. But I'm going to pray for you now. And you just submit yourself into Christ just at this hour while I pray. Dear God, we would ask Thy divine mercy upon these waiting, penitent souls who believe that You are and a rewarder of those that diligently seek after Thee. And I would ask You to be merciful unto them, Lord, and whatever there is, the cancer of doubt, the cancer of temper, the malignancy of unbelief, take it out just now, Lord, and give them the Holy Ghost Fill their soul with your goodness. Baptize them into thy kingdom just now as they have raised their hands in the confession of their faith. And 
asking thee, O oh merciful God, to do this for them. For they have changed their thoughts of, of drifting around on the sea. They want to come into the dock and be hewed out by the master builder and made a new creature in Christ Jesus and empowered with His Spirit, governed by His will. So give it to them just now, Father, as we humbly ask in Jesus' name, Thy Son. And now, Lord, there was many hands who went up in the air or that went up in the air. They realized that they have been from place to place, many of them. They have drove many miles across the, the states to get to such and such a person that prays for the sick. And they have come maybe a long ways down here. And I do appreciate that, Lord. What if they didn't believe in me as your servant? Then they wouldn't come. I thank you for letting them have faith in my prayer. Lord God, I sincerely pray for each one just now that you, the great God of heaven, will move your Holy Spirit into their life and will cut off every unbelief let them know that it's faith is the victory. Not some person of earth, not some church or some certain prayer from some man, which all helps. But faith is the victory. Amen. We read of where thy son, our Savior, went into his own country. And there were those who said, who is this fellow? Is not that the carpenter's son? Do we not know him and his mother? And her name is Mary. And here is Jude and Joseph and his sisters. And they were offended at him. And he marveled at their unbelief and could do no mighty works. We realize no matter how great the person might be favored before you, yet our own faith is the victory. Amen. I pray, God, that you will let man out of this and show yourself here tonight where faith is centered on the principles of the resurrection of our Lord. He is not dead, but He is alive forevermore. And He made a promise, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the world. And we believe that He is here. And we pray, dear God, that tonight that He will show Himself visible, present. And may then the Holy Spirit catch every heart and perform the operation on the faith so that they can overcome their sickness and their afflictions and their diseases. Go out of here with a set faith, no matter if not one thing takes place, yet it'll create a faith that says it's done. That's the victory. It overcomes the world. For we ask it in His name and for His glory. Amen. I just hardly see how I could call a prayer line. For that door is jammed into the street and this is jammed into the street and around the windows and around the doors and up here. I could try it. If you wish for me to, I, I could try to call a prayer line. But I will say this after this thing I preached conviction to myself. I believe if you'll just be reverent and just take all the faith that you've got as human faith and turn it over into the hands of God and say, Now, Lord, take my little I got to give you and let your faith come to me. Amen. 
I believe that he'll heal you. And let me call you right out from this platform without even you coming up here at all. Could you believe that? Amen. Amen. But if you've got your prayer card, you hang on to it. We're going to use it anyhow. So we believe. Now, I'd like that's just now come to my mind. For Billy Paul told me just as we come in a few minutes ago, he gave out some prayer cards yet tonight. Because we'd taken up quite a bunch last night. And he said, there was some in there, Daddy, that wanted prayer cards. And I gave them prayer cards. I said, that's all right. He said, but how are you going to call a prayer line? Then the crowd was back there. Now they're all the way around the side. So there's hardly a way to do it, to call a prayer line. We don't, what's the difference of you standing here or standing where you're at? But it's going to take some faith to do that. Amen. It's going to take your faith plus my faith with God's faith. Mix it together and my faith and your faith will fade out and God's faith will become Amen. predominant Amen. and the works will be done. Amen. Just want to ask you this upon these bases. Do you believe this to be the Word of God? It cannot lie then if it's God's Word. It has to be true. Then if it is God's Word and it is true, then He's obligated to every word that He spoke in here. He's obligated to keep that Word. Now, if you were sick and were dying with uh, leukemia or cancer or whatever you had, tubercular, and you come up here and brought a, the, all the ministers that we knew in the building and bring them here and pray for them, every one of you, still, unless you yourself has got faith, it would not work. But if someone would be healed, uh, perhaps that you would notice that God healed or claimed they were healed, that would help your faith because you'd see they got healed. And Durban, South Africa recently, I was praying and they brought one person to the platform and you know the story, I have told it to many of you, how that one woman was healed there being a Mohammedan and they just got so many out of each tribe, which some 20 tribes or more were there. And then when it come to a place, to a boy that had been born, stooped over, walked on his hands. And when the Holy Spirit began to tell him he was a, a Zula. And when the Holy Spirit began to speak and tell that man, an African hottentot, didn't even know which is right and left hand. And even told him who he was. They set up and the witch doctor stood spellbound. What new thing is this, they said. And the chiefs that were being fanned with the fans made the fans stop. But it said, in your hut where you live, there is a picture of my Lord hanging on the wall. And his father and mother way back in there with hundreds of thousands of people raised up to testify the truth. And said now that you've got a brother that was riding on a yellow goat or dog and hurt his leg and he walks on a crutch. And he's present at the meeting. But his faith just now has overcome and he's healed. Because why? That shock of a white man could not even speak his language, could tell him who he was and what had happened. What type of power was that? And the boy heard that through the translator and he threw down his crutches and here he come running and jumping for joy. And when his brother who could know not which is right and left hand, but thought I was trying to get him to do a, a dance, a native dance, 
seen his brother running and jumping. It done something to him. And he passed the sin barriers of unbelief. And I looked back and there was a vision that told him to stand on his feet. He was healed. And the boy, not even with an intelligence enough, with mind enough to know what I said, as the interpreter told him. And he had a chain on his neck. And I got a hold of the chain and said, Jesus Christ makes you well. Stand up! That boy who was born afflicted stood to his feet. Not only that, but in his right mind. The tears running down his black belly. And the glory of God fell over that place there until 25,000 raw heathens were healed at one time. What did they do? The next morning I was sitting in the window after the mayor of the city had come said, watch out that window if you've got a surprise. And the next morning here come seven big cattle trucks full of crutches and wheelchairs and things walking down the street, going down the street with the people who was in them the night before, walking down the street, Zulus and Shungai and Bazutas and Kozas, all the different tribes that was war with one another was at peace, hand to hand, saying, all things are possible, only believe in their own naked son. I raised from the window and put my hands in the air and answered back, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that would save a wretch like me. It was a glorious sight. These eyes of mine nearly ever beheld until I seen the Lord in the vision at the time. What is it? It stirs something. Them people were in floaters. They'd just never heard before. And when they heard, just with childlike simplicity, they just grabbed it. That's all there was. They just, they didn't have to have any operation. <laughs> they just saw it in one after it. It was theirs. There was nobody could tell them any difference. They don't see it happen. Now, if the Lord Jesus still lives, and it's here in Jeffersonville, Indiana, in these United States of America, if he's just the same God was here the night to give that blind preacher his sight. He's the same God that give that little leukemia child dying when the doctors the next morning pronounced her well. Just recently, I've got the article of it right here, I believe, in one of these books. I'm not sure. I was just reading it the other day, and I think I placed it back in some of this stuff here. I might not be. I'm not sure. But I was reading an article from one of the... Here it is, right here. One of the papers up here in Michigan. Uh, when I was on my last campaign up here. The article in the paper. Where there was a woman. I, it was at Burlington, Vermont. And she was all disappointed she didn't get a prayer card from the boys that day. And uh, Jean and Leo and Billy and some would be here that was there. And she was sitting way back. And all of a sudden, she wondered why she couldn't get in that prayer line. And the first person come up and it said, You're Mrs. So-and-so from a certain place and something, something taking place. Right then she broke through that barrier. She said, I know that woman. And I know that's the truth. No more than she thought that in her heart till the great Holy Spirit called me around and said, Mrs. So-and-so sitting here. Way back twice the distance of this building, the little lady on the end with the green dress on said, you're Mrs. So -and such a name. Said, you suffer with epilepsy. You have four or five spells every day. And said, why? And she jumped to her feet. That was her. And she was so astounded she didn't know what to do. And said, not only that, but you are very upset because your husband is in the veterans hospital and they have removed practically all of his stomach and now the disease has got into another part of his body and there is no chance for him to live, says the doctors. And she with tears running down her cheeks as the paper explains, she raised her hands that that was the truth. Just then in the vision, I saw him coming home. And I said, Thus saith the Lord. 
Don't you weary. He'll be home well. Amen. And the next morning, when he was going in for an examination for surgery again, when that great lumps of Hodgson's disease is breaking through his body, the doctor he said, I don't even feel any lump. And the doctors examining couldn't find any lump. Put him under x-ray and took every test and he was perfectly well and come home the next day sound and well. Why? Wow. Faith is the victory. No prayer card, no hands laid on, no nothing, but faith is the victory that overcomes all. That's the way. My last meeting in Chicago, there was a colored lady standing on the platform. I, I beg your pardon, I believe it was a white woman that was standing on the platform and the night before a little old Swedish woman was there and Billy seen her reach down and put so much money into an offering for Brother Osborne for his uh, African black gold call. His campaign. And Billy said to me, how did that poor little woman with the little spotted looking dress on, how did she ever have that much money to put in that offering? And so when Billy started out, she said, give me a prayer card, honey. I said, I haven't got any more. He went over to Gene or Leo, one was giving them out and asked they didn't have any more. So he said, sister, I'll see you tomorrow night and give you one. So all right, honey. And goes up in the balcony somewhere and sits down. I never knew of it. Then when I come in on the platform that night, and one woman was on the platform, she was sitting up there, and she broke through that barrier into a place where God operated on her faith. There when she hit that spot, it said that little woman sitting way up there in that second balcony, second person in with that little checkered dress on. Her name is Miss So-and-so-and-so and, so and, so, and she's praying for her husband who's a dispatcher on the railroad, deaf in one ear. And she almost fainted. She was a Lutheran. And it, when she got home and the Lord said, Thus saith the Lord, he's healed. When she got home that night, he was standing at the door rejoicing. And at that very same minute, his ear come open when he was sitting on a seat at the dispatcher's office. Amen. A colored woman sitting out there saw that and believed. And she was believing for her sister who had been ten years in a mental institution in Little Rock. In the insane asylum. And the Holy Spirit come to her and told her who she was and who her sister was. And said she's been a raging maniac, butting her head against the wall for ten years. But thus, saith the Lord she's just been healed and the next morning when they went through the door the matron found her standing at the door begging to get out in her normal right mind she sent word to her sister Chicago and she screamed out she said merciful God that's what was said on the platform last night Amen. She said, dear, I know you got no money, but I'll send you an airplane ticket right quick. Get here. The meeting closes tomorrow night. And the woman who had been in mental institute ten years, the very next night stood on the platform and gave praise to Almighty Amen. God. Amen. What was it? Her sister broke through that place of the things of the world. Things of the world don't only mean uh, smoking and drinking and show running. It means unbelief. She broke through all of that until she found that her faith overcomes. She said, if God can do that for that white woman, God can do that for me, a colored woman. God did it and God will do it every time that our faith overcomes doubt. No matter how bad it is. Oh, He lives. Is there any person here that happened to have been in Chicago that night that heard the woman testify? Raise up your hands. They, well, yes, look all around here. Sure. It was there a woman that had been in an institution all these years. What is it? Faith is the victory. 
Now, if that same Jesus is here tonight, then if I can let my faith loose to His promise, then He'll come right back and do the same thing if you can let your faith loose to the promise. Amen. If He will do it to any of you sitting out in that audience, will you believe He still lives? Is that the way He did when He was on earth? Is that the way the apostles did? Paul looked upon the man and so forth, and while Jesus told the woman at the well, while the woman touched his garment, went out and sat down, he turned around and said, Who touched me? Didn't know who touched. So he said, Who touched me all tonight? He said, But I got weak. Virtue went from me. And he looked around until he found the woman had done it. She'd had a blood issue and told her, Your faith has got the victory. <laughs> what is it? He never said, I healed you. He said, Your faith has saved you. What did you do? You had faith that overcome, that subdued, that trank down every doubt. For she said within her heart, If I can touch his garment, I'll be made well. Jesus had, she had to take that by something she thought in her own mind. Here's his own word. Claim that he'd be here in this day and do the same that he did then. A little while and the world won't see me no more, yet you shall see me. The works that I do shall you do also. Even more than this shall I go to my Father. And you'll do more than this. Amen. Here it is. We're living in this last day. Jesus is here. Let us pray. And let us believe. And you believe while I pray. Lord, here is a group of people. And you're a great God. We see in the Bible where you heal the multitudes. Where that in the journey of Israel, Moses, when they come out of the wilderness, there wasn't one feeble person among them. You're the great doctor. You're the great surgeon. And now, Lord, let these people who are here sick tonight, in their body or in their soul, that they might just now commit their case unto your hands, the great physician. And operate on them, Father, to the extent that all their doubt would be taken away. Now, your word said that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We pray you use that for a night. And bring that knife down and declare yourself to be the same. I'll be with you even in you. And then, Lord, when the people see that you are here, may their faith climb above every disease that there is in the building of sin or sickness and be healed. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you realize or appreciate the position it puts me in? Now looky here. There's at least 250 people standing here, more than that, I guess. Yeah, I guess there is more. I, I don't know. But there's a big host of you I don't know. How many here doesn't know? You know what I don't know? You're, I don't know what's wrong with you. Raise up your hand. Yes, sir. Well, there's everywhere. Sure. I don't know. But he does. Now, if he will, if you'll just submit yourself to him and let him speak to you by the same faith that the woman had, will you believe him? If, if, it's, if anything is a proven fact, it's a proven fact. If somebody come down here and said, I have a cure for cancer. He took a cancer out here, going into a bad condition, and took the doctors down there and proved them that cancer could be cured. Everybody in the world would rush for that, for that cure. Ah, oh, brother, I've seen Jesus Christ cure so many cancers. But yet, he only asked one thing, if you believe. That seems to be the hardest thing. I've seen him open the eyes of the blind, make the cripple walk. I've seen him raise the dead up after they've been dead, pronounced for the doctor. So many things it would take. I couldn't write volumes of books to tell what I have seen him do myself. And yet it's so hard to get to believe. Now, if 
All you sick people in here, I want everyone just as reverent as you can. Now, I believe I'm a great believer in emotion. I believe anything that hasn't got emotion is dead. If your religion has got a little emotion about it, you better bear it. Because... <laughs> But there is times for all things. If you come to me and I could give it to you and say, Brother Branham, I want a hundred dollars. You'd come real respectable and say, Brother Branham, I'm desperately in need for a hundred dollars. And, and you know I had a hundred dollars in my pocket. And you believe that upon my working on my sympathy that I'd give you that hundred dollars. Well, now you'd stand there reverently expecting to receive it. Then when I gave you that hundred dollars, you could just scream as loud as you wanted to. You got the hundred dollars in your hand. <laughs> now, but when you're coming, come with respects. Don't come screaming and ask me for the hundred dollars. I might not understand you. See? But you come ask me, and then when I give you the hundred dollars, then start screaming. <laughs> so when let's come to God and ask Him to move His Holy Spirit in the side of the walls or outside the walls, wherever it may be. I don't care where you're standing, wherever it is. I don't care. If it's across the country and you're praying for somebody, you'll move it. And let's just see. God said, prove me. That's a good way to prove whether God is God or not. Prove me, saith the Lord. Now, if He is God, then, and we know He is, let's ask Him to do the things here tonight that He did, and then you won't have to come up here. And if it's done, at least three different people... Across the building, if it happens, to, if it strikes on people that I do know, I, I don't want to accept that as one. See, I want it to, on somebody that I do not know. Now, as far as knowing diseases, there's only one person in here that I know of of any disease. Now, that's not a disease. That's my good and sweet little friend Edith Wright sitting back there. I know her. She had suffered for years. We prayed for her, and she never went out of pain. Then has been for a long time. But the Lord has never delivered the girl from her affliction. I know what's wrong with Edith. Outside of that, I don't know anyone in here what disease you have. But if you know me, then I'd, I'd rather it would be so that you'll see that it isn't me, that it's the Lord. Now you pray, I'll pray, and let's just believe the Lord. And now, Sister Gertie, just as slow as you can, I want you to play the great physician now is near, the sympathizing Jesus. I'm looking across here at Brother Banks Woods, a friend of mine. And he knows Brother Woods here at the tabernacle. He's one of the trustees here. But he was formerly a Jehovah Witness. This was certainly a thing to him. But when he come to Louisville and seen the Lord do something, he had a crippled boy. Kind of an infantile prowess had drawn his leg up. And he followed the meetings. I didn't know, never heard of him. But when he come up here somewhere, I come back from overseas from Sweden... Sitting way back in the building that night, the Lord Jesus called to that boy, David, and healed him. And today, the boy hardly knows which leg it was that was healed of. Oh, hundreds of things. If you just believe. Now, one time I can think of, and I really asked for that. I remember, it was, I see some Amish people, I believe, or either Mennonite one in the building with the little ladies with their little caps on. That's just what caused me to think that. I was in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And there was a little Mennonite girl who had received the Holy Ghost. Or it might have been Amish. It was one of those, one of those uh, uh, people, either the Mennonite uh, or the Amish. And she was a, a lovely girl. And she was playing the great physician now is near the sympathizing Jesus. And there was a, a little baby that had been brought into my arms that was crippled. And when I prayed, the little baby was healed and jumped out of my arms and run down the platform. And the mother fainted. And the Amish or Mennonite girl knew the lady. And she, the Holy Spirit struck her and she began to shout and she raised up her hands and run away from the piano. And the piano never missed a note playing the great position. Now is near the sympathizing Jesus. 
coming down through those aisles from everywhere, people were crowding over one another, and them ivory keys moving up and down. The great physician now is here, the sympathizing Jesus. And they laying in the floor in the aisles overcome by by terrier of the or the Holy Spirit's presence. He still lives. He's still Jesus. Now let's just quietly hum that just for a minute. And then we then we'll see what the Lord said. Everyone now send yourself to faith. And begin to look this way and believe with all your heart. The great physician is Just begin to move out all doubts. Many of you have never seen this before. Say, I'll believe it anyhow. Jesus, I'm not fanatically but it just seems to me now just like I go into my room pull the door together enter into a secret closet and close the door I just close off all the audience from around now see, and pray to your father who seeth in secret and he that seeth in secret shall reward you openly Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, ye shall find. Knock, and it will be open for every one that seeketh find. Imagine him here now. That you see on the picture there, the light, the halo. It isn't far. It's the discerner of the thoughts. It's Christ. A little while, I come from God and I will return to God. He did. Went right back to what he was. When he comes again, he'll be in a corporal body. Like he was the Lord Jesus. You might say, Brother Bram, what are you doing? Just getting myself yielded. Now that's, I'm just standing here. This is not a show now. No, sir. Don't you think that you be on bad ground. It's trying, trying to press into somewhere. God's word's at stake. I said that he was. What if it isn't? He always will keep his word. I'm not afraid of that. Someone, somewhere, will strike that hem of his garment. The Bible said he is now, right now, a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. You're looking at me so sincere, lady. Sing out that blue dress on. I don't know you, I don't believe. 
I can't seem to get a contact anywhere with someone's faith. Maybe it would help. You have a need of God? If I'm a stranger, you raise up your hand. I don't know you, but you know me. All right. I have no idea what you're here for. I've never seen you in my life as a know of. You've probably been in my meeting somewhere. <clears throat> if the Lord Jesus will tell me what your trouble is, you believe it? You'd have to believe it if it's the truth. And maybe that'll give faith to others to go to work. With you. I don't know. I just seen you sitting there looking at me. You just haven't hardly taken your eyes from me. You're closed. This woman sitting in front here, I know her. These people here, I know. I didn't think I knew you. I don't. But he does. And if you have a need, just like you've been standing on a platform. Yes? Now, if anyone can see, I hope you can. It looks to me that the woman is getting real dim. But she's something or another wrong. She has a skin disease. That's right. Raise up your hand if that's true. On her body that doesn't show, but she has. That's correct. See, just the contact. While the, he said, look on us and while they look steadfast on them. Paul said, I perceive that you have faith to be here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How about the little lady sitting next to you? It kind of broke through a barrier to her because she was praying also. I don't know you. We're strangers to one another. That's right. If the Holy Spirit will reveal to me what your trouble is or what you're here for or something in your life that you know I do not know, will you believe that it's the, uh, that power, unseen force, comes from Christ? I want to ask you something. Right now, you have a feeling on you, real sweet, meek, humble feeling. If that's right, raise your hand. See? That's it. Right above you stands that light. Mm-hmm. And you're suffering with trouble from your feet and legs. That's right, isn't it? Wave that handkerchief to the people if that's right so they'll see. I don't think you'll ever be bothered with it again. That's... Uh, what's doing that? What's, there's people I've never seen in my life. What's doing it? That's two. There's a young man sitting right next to the woman right there now. And he started weeping as soon as that struck. It's something or another about that woman. No, it's the young man himself. He's bothered with his throat and head. That's right. I believe you're a stranger to me, young man. I've never seen you. That's right. That's right. That's right. Raise up your hand. There's three people sitting in a row. I've never seen no contact in my life to those people. Will you believe? Somebody in this direction now is in here. How many is sick and needy in this direction? Raise your hand. Everyone in this direction is needy. Oh, well, it's just everywhere. I just keep believing. The man sitting and looking at me, you must find Christ or die. Mm. Cancer would kill you. God's the healer. This elderly lady sitting here, right here on the seat. She suffers with a stomach trouble. No arthritis. That's correctly. You believe it's done? You looking around at her. You believe? You have a need of Christ? You believe me to be his servant? That growth that you won't take it away? You believe God to do it? I don't see the growth, but it's there. It's on your neck, in the back. 
Maybe if I tell you your name is Miss Welch, would you believe me then? Is it? That's right, isn't it? i never seen you in my life, you know. And, mm-hmm. You have faith in God. There's a death sign with a little woman sitting there. Cancer also. You believe, lady, that God will make you well? You do? Suffering with cancer. It's a black shadow hanging over you. I'll tell you now, it's gone. If you believe. Amen. I don't know the woman. I've never seen her in my life. I don't know any of these people as far as I know. Amen. Will you believe? I'm looking at a man. I don't guess I ever seen him before in my life. He suffers with a hernia. You believe the Lord will heal you, sir, of that hernia? Make you well? Your wife has a nervous and a weakness. Reverend Reed. That's your name. I don't know you. You're not from this country anyhow. You're from Ohio. That's correct. That's right. Raise up. It's all over now. For you and your wife, Bo. Believe with all your heart. Can you now believe? Way back down this line, back towards this way. Can't you see that light hanging right there? It's a woman suffering with a virus infection right down on this line here. You're not from this city. You're from a place called Columbus, Indiana. Your name is Elizabeth. You live on a street called Ohio Street. Your number is 1932 Ohio Street. Go believe it's left you now. Have faith. And now that spirit moves. It goes this way over here to a man. There's some connection. No, it's, he's from Columbus. And he suffers with an eye condition and uh, an ulcer. You believe the Lord Jesus will heal you, sir? Make you well? And your little nephew sitting in front of you there, your sister's child. It had some kind of a bone disease. And it won't eat now. It makes kind of like a complex to it. If you'll believe with all your heart, you may be made well. Amen. Have faith in God. How many of you believe now? I see another shadow of cancer sitting there. If you'll believe with all your heart, sister, it shall be done. Can, is your faith past that doubting line now? How many believes your faith surpassed the doubting line? Raise up your hand. Then what's left but run free? <laughs> it's all over. These little girls sitting here in the chair. I know you. I didn't know you from last night, but I do know you now. I learned of you today from my wife. Your mother's name was Falkerson before she was married. And that's a disease that nobody knows nothing about it. Your fingers just get infection and you get blood disease-like or something in your hands and the first thing you know, fingers come off and so forth, both you little girls. 
You're two beautiful little ladies. I know your mother, your grandmother was healed one night when I went to her 20-something years ago with TB. That's right, Mrs. Falkerson. God rebuked that devil that's hindering you beautiful little girls. May the power that raised Jesus from the grave cast that thing away. Never bother you no more. I say that on the authority of God's Word. You have to get angry with the devil. God gives us the victory. we got it right now. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Even your faith. All you that believe that you're healed by His power, stand up on your feet and give Him praise. Everywhere in the building. Raise your hands down. Let's praise Him. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your healing power. This is the faith that overcomes. This is the victory. Even our faith, we now pronounce them healed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grant it, Lord. I will praise Him, Bertie. Have you passed the barrier line? Praise the Lamb for sinners.
wonders all pass by me out. Oh, how wonderful! Oh, he's glorious. How many of you feel the presence of God right now? Sure. Now, let ever doubt fade from you. You are healed. By stripes, you are healed. It's over. Praise and giving glory. The Holy Spirit falling all around in the building. The great halo of light circling the place. How wonderful. How we love him. And when the battle's over, oh, we shall wear the crown. like the Holy Spirit that fell on the day of Pentecost, that cut loose the fetters. I just happened to notice standing here in the meeting is a Mennonite brother. At Indianapolis, he come in and been having epilepsy for many, many years. And the Holy Spirit called him out in the meeting, I believe it was. And he's never had a spell of it. The Lord God healed him and made him perfect. Well, a Mennonite preacher. Isn't he wonderful? No one knows that those who have tasted his goodness knows how good he is. Now, friends, to my opinion, this is the old-time religion when the Lord Jesus Christ comes into our midst and blesses us. We're so happy you're here. I believe that every person that's in divine presence is right now, if your faith is sunk all the doubts behind. You're free now. Just don't never claim any sickness from now on. Go on. You committed your case to one doctor. Commit it to Jesus now. He's operated on you and taken all the doubt away so we can have it. The Lord bless you.